Well, Brad, uh, this is really special. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you. I know your time is incredibly precious. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for carving out some to catch up with me. And, you know, this is a, a conversation that is designed to be authentic. So there's no script to follow, but a really an opportunity for, I guess, me to meet you. But then also, you know, we have tens of thousands of listeners. A lot of them uh, are young men. Um, um, and, you know, when the opportunity came up to meet with you, I was like, oh, that would be incredible because in my eyes, you know, I know I just briefly mentioned this to you offline, but like the ability to witness um, someone who I see is like kind of multi-dimensional able to play in the corporate world have some fun outside of it in the arts and you know your, your passion for music but also you know in the bits i've read online and interviews i've watched i know family is also really important so i'm excited to spend a bit of time with you and thank you no thank you for having me and beautiful autumn day in sydney you know a week to easter the hot cross buns are selling good uh, it feels good to be in sydney at a time like this Amazing. Well, I think Sydney in, in winter is one of the most magic places in the world. Great secret. Um, Brad, as we kind of evolve into, we'll get into the business side of things and obviously everything you're doing in Woolies um, and particularly around purpose in Woolies. That's really what I want to anchor this conversation in. But just for, um, yeah, I guess the people listening in, love to just hear a little bit more about your background. So South African uh, at heart, am I allowed to say that? Or yeah, how, how would you describe your background? Uh, well, I, 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 it depends who I talk to. I'm either an Italian or a South African. If I'm talking too much, then I'm an, an Italian. If I'm very <laughs> yeah. direct, then I'm a South African. But I've been in Australia for, you know, most of my, well, certainly all of my working life and, and, you know, more than half of my life. Now, I think there's a bit of an African aesthetic that I think you uh, would think I probably still have and hanker for. Mm. Uh, you know, that love of Africa at sunset is one that never leaves you, I think. Uh, but uh, it, coming back to purpose, what I think is important is I did I live through apartheid South Africa and um, it's a terrible weight to carry, but it also provides great lessons and learnings and guideposts for, you know, how I think about the world today. So it was a forming characteristic, I guess, of who I am uh, as a leader as versus um, – watching that sunset with a great gin and tonic in Africa. <laughs> uh, so, it, you know, it was a very seminal time in, in you know, for, for my generation of South Africans and, and um, you know, it does shape a lot of the way I think about purpose. Yeah, I talk to my mother-in-law occasionally just when she brings in the word apartheid, it's like I'm like, whoa, you know, it's a big, yeah. it's a word that represents so much. How has it been raising children um, in a world who, you know, it's very different to apartheid South Africa. How have you balanced, you know, up bringing these kids up, you know, obviously to share your family values, but also, you know, coming from a world that is very different to kind of modern 2023 Sydney, Australia? Yeah. I'm not, well, I think, um, I think, you know, apartheid, you know, was a particular form of discrimination. Um, and I think those discrimination still exists and is alive and well in the society we live in. It's just manifests differently in Australia. Mm. Um, obviously, there's a very topical issue around first-generation Australians right now with, um, you know, the voice. Yeah. Uh, but I also think there's a lot of uh, discrimination against first-generation Australians, not, not certainly from an Anglo-Saxon background like I am, but I'm acutely sensitive to the fact that we're the biggest employer of first-generation Australians and have... It's hard to tell because you can't collect the stats, maybe 35, 40,000. Very hardworking, highly committed um, first generation team members from you know the Indian subcontinent, uh, Asia and so on. And, and so I do think a lot about them and what they confront and have to deal with in, in our society as well as, of course, First Nations where we are still very, we are, we would like to be the biggest employer of First Nations uh, Australians and we're not, not yet. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I think about those forms of discrimination as well as being the father of two daughters and, you know, what, what it's, you know, how does a woman succeed in, in a, a world that still has a lot of unconscious bias or conscious bias in mm. some, some instances uh, for them to achieve their full potential. So it's the same kind of thinking, just a very different, different issue, I think. And so mm. uh, it's on my mind. Uh, and and what uh, someone said this to me the other day, they said, well, you know, you've clearly got some biases, you know, coming whether, whether it's from Africa or uh, 
or from Italy, hmm. uh, or from having worked at the Boston Consulting Group for 15 years before I went into retail. And, you know, what are you going to do about those? And uh, my answer to, the, to it is pretty straightforward, which is uh, be aware of them. The first thing on any bias is to be aware of it. You can't address it unless you're aware of it. If you're aware of it, you can. It's those hidden unconscious biases that are most at risk. And when I go back to my youth, it was only, you know, later in life I realised how many biases there were in that society. Mm. But I wasn't fully aware of it as I grew up. So I think that becomes quite important in, in how you sort of frame these issues up in today's world. I think also having some self-compassion for your biases because I think my experience and the study I've done in them is that we all have biases. We're human beings and it's a, nat- it's a product of both nature and nurture. You know, how the environment upon which we're surrounded by, the role models we're, or lack of role models we're exposed to, but also in our personality type, what becomes like the winning formulas to help us get through a variety of circumstances may work for one circumstance but might actually be quite destructive for the next or not as inclusive for the next circumstance and i think yeah the the art (laughs) again not that i've nailed it is how to not take it personally you know this is around shaping our character as a better person and as a better leader and that comes with looking at your, your blind spots but also being open to people from different backgrounds you know whatever that background is but also different ages um, and back with, um, you know, you just mentioned your daughters. Have they played a role in supporting you to look at different biases that have been there? Yeah, well, I think so. I mean, I, I mean if you come back to uh, what I think is key in business, and I know, you know, a lot of the conversations that you would have are w- with people as individuals, uh, I think everything is contextual. And I think, uh, you know, no leader is successful without the right team around them. And so whenever we talk about this issue in Woolworths, I always sort of, you know, come back to what's the team and how does that team self-correct? And they all come with different uh, forms of bias, but how do they therefore self-correct each other? And in that context, the thing that's with me a lot is um, diversity is the key to great decision-making, just Mm. as great performing organisations over time have diversity in them, diversity of thought. And diversity in thought invariably comes back to diversity of background, diversity of age, gender, you know, you name it, experiences. Yeah. So I do think that, you know, that's the key. Everything's contextual. You need to have all the diverse um, opinions there in order to make the right decision there. Otherwise, you'll default to your natural style, which could work fabulously seven times and then be a disaster in the next three, right? That's right, yeah. So, you know, to me, that's key. And when I actually... Um, Started at uh, started at Woolworths. Um, I came there through a strange uh, series of events, but uh, both of my daughters at that stage were vegan, and it made it very interesting and very focused for me. And they're extremely environmentally active, and so mm. the whole and this was you know shoot, this is you know eight nine years ago. Yeah. It really did help center me around you know where are we going, what's the healthy options we provide in our stores. Where is the echo agenda going to? What does it mean? How do we think about it? Uh, and so it, it was um, immensely, immensely helpful. I mean, even uh, last week on the topic of inflation, it's a very painful issue. Um, I don't think uh, my wife would mind me mentioning she's from a Polish tradition and she mm. knows what value looks like. And yeah. It gave me a hard time on the price of finished dishwashing tablets. And I <laughs> yeah. said, well, why don't you buy our own brand, Shine? They're, so, they're such great value. Stop giving me a hard time. Go and buy some Shine dishwashing tablets. I ran for the door afterwards. <laughs> yeah, uh, but actually, you've got to kind of, you got to keep it real. And, um, and I think having those voices at the dinner table is as much a part of keeping it real as it is at the, uh, you know, in the boardroom, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that's key. I think also like, um, you know, young passionate, values-orientated people are phenomenal advisors um, on the pulse of what I would say where consciousness is up to, where where public consciousness is up to and almost probably a little bit ahead um, potentially as well, which, you know, I think as you – and I'm sure we'll get there, but when it comes to (laughs) pre-planning, you know, the the quantum upon which you need to plan to, you know, feed a nation, having that pulse inside the family home, that kind of – you know, presses you probably, I imagine, in some pretty uncomfortable moments when there's a lot of complexity in the types of decisions and the, the magnitude of decisions that you need to make. I had, it used to be a terrible joke I made when I joined Woolworths, which I'm at risk, I'll, I'll tell it again. Um, when I first joined, I said, listen, I live in the future, I live in Bondi, you know, you live in the past, I just need you to meet me in the present. 
Uh, and it was quite a shocking thing to say, and I'm embarrassed even recalling the story. But what I was trying to do was send to our team on, let's be very forward thinking about where the world's going, what's required. We need to be progressive. We had to shape a nation mm. in terms of healthy habits, not respond. So let you know, let's get on that agenda of of how we how we shape. And in order to shape, you do need to be aware of your unconscious bias. Mine is living in Bondi. Right? Yeah. It, it ain't it ain't where the action is. And so, a three at least three Saturdays a month, I I, I go um, I travel. To you know, my last couple of Saturdays was um, was in Blacktown, um, you know, or uh, getting out uh, to to Penrith to Parramatta. And when people want to meet me, and I say I'll meet you in the centre of Sydney, and they say where does where's that? And I say well it's Parramatta, so yeah. we'll meet at, uh, in the centre, the Westfield at, in Parramatta, which is and and that is Sydney. That's representative of Sydney, the ethnic diversity of Sydney. Uh, the composition of it and an income level, and you've got to remind yourself though, those are the customers we're talking about. You know, there there they are. You know, and they're various wonderful, interesting, colourful manifestations. So um, yeah, I think that's you know, coming back to the unconscious bias, be aware of it, and then how do you address it? And to me, you address it by going to find where the customer is and who is the customer and what are they looking for. And that gives you an anchor for mm. every decision you need to make. It's mm. pretty straightforward if you start there. So who is it? Where are they? Let's meet them, understand them. Uh, I don't think it's that complex from there on in. I mean, it's complex in moving stuff around. Logistics is complex, but that's, you know, if you anchor from a customer, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I guess the other side of that is it's easy, I think, when you, you know, in my little micro example, but getting more, you know, further away is like you're growing the business and, you know, there's more decisions that need to be made, more corporate stakeholders, you know, public appearances, but then the customer and the feeling and the essence of the customer is the magic, right? And it's, it makes me think of this like sentiment that, you know, is an amazing lead up. She's based in uh, Melbourne, Jane Tewson, and um, kind of the sentiment of her charity is to meet the people and feel the issues. And I think it, you know, I just it mm. makes me yeah. you know, reflect on exactly what you're saying is, particularly as a leader, you know, having that input from a, a, like a close, intimate sensory experience, it, like infuses you with the decision making abilities to actually make the best, most higher order decision. Yeah, I think that. Well, I mean, I think it's key. And I was saying this um, before I did Woolworths. I was actually I worked for a ins- very inspirational entrepreneur. We founded Tyro Payments, yeah. which uh, floated a couple of years ago. Uh, undertake of often now, so but controversial, uh, I think, for that team. Uh, but I was with this, uh, his name was Joe Stallman, very, mm. very famous entrepreneur. And we were talking last night, and he said, What's your biggest fear? And I said, My biggest fear is losing contact with the customer or the team member uh, because you get staged managed mm. um, in these senior roles, and everyone knows you come in, therefore, they set That's the right. store up perfectly yeah. before you get there. The team, I know what you like, so they'll say things to please you. They don't tell you how things are really going. And, and slowly you lose contact with reality and then slowly your decision-making becomes based on a world that you think exists that doesn't exist. Mm. Um, probably goes back a little bit to apartheid, funny enough. But, <laughs> um, you know, how do you keep that and keep it real and actively listen? No, not, don't get in there with a premeditated idea that you listen to. So... I th- think about it a lot and the way I do it is by getting out there. Yeah. So. It makes me also think around like I use the language sometimes around like playing offense versus defense, which I think is a nice way to frame up how do I approach business and entrepreneurship but also just growing a movement. And um, the idea of even from like a psychological mindset point of view, playing offense at trying to solve a problem means you're always looking to move forward, always kind of like weaving and ducking and diving but also like you know vaguely where you want to end up. But um, the ability to not get complacent in when it's so seductive and something in the human condition to just settle uh, into complacency. But I think, I guess my question for you is like, how do you ensure that you do play offense at this? Because I know you have to as part of business's, you know, mandate, but what do you personally do? Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, I think I, but I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, you're either moving forward or by implication. In particularly in today's business world, you're moving you're moving backwards, right? So, mm. um, so I, I, I do think it's key, and there's always ways you can improve, and and you know, uh, and that inspires me. It gets me out of bed every morning. Actually, that's the most fun bit of of the job. Uh, it was, imp- you know, one of the things I did want to mention was. 
at Woolies when when we had a crisis, which we did seven years ago, and there were rumours about us getting broken up and we were negative growth net mm. to calls. We asked our team what they wanted from us and we kind of, what do you guys need? You know, do you want to reduce prices or give more hours or get rid of the self-checkouts, which were angry in a lot of people. The team said they want purpose. Mm. And so we were kind of been very thoughtful on purpose. Mm. And in that purpose, it was to give a team a belief, but it was meant to be forward-looking, and in that purpose is embedded the inherent desire to improve. Uh, so the group purpose of Woolies is we create better experiences together for a better tomorrow. Uh, and the word tomorrow gets used by many, but it's very deliberate. It's mm. better together as a team for a better tomorrow, like not in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, but the day after. And so... In that is this desire to continue to improve, right? I mean, it's yeah. baked in, and you know, you know, better for customers, better for team, better for communities, better for shareholders. Mm. Um, and and I like the word better because uh, you know it's not best. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, there's humility in the word better, and everyone can be better. Like it's you know, it's yeah, you know, like there's nothing that you can't be better at, right? In yeah. whatever aspect of your life. So so we have that sitting there, which I think is is really important. So if you've got that and then if you listen to customers, not what they say they want but what you think that they really need, uh, you know, there are a thousand things every day that we can we can be better at yeah. and we can, you know, we can move forward at. Funny enough, the meeting just before this while you were waiting for the podcast was uh, speaking to the head of the, our biggest union, the SDA, and he was giving me some advice of what his, you know, members are saying and where the pressures and stresses mm. are. Mm. And I was, you know, listening to someone who's got thousands of members who work at Woolies, and it was he gave some good advice, mm. you know. So, I think what you got to be is open to the advice yeah. or they're open to the feedback, uh, and sometimes you don't like it, and this will be your challenge as well. Where you don't like it invariably is where it's going to hit your financials, yeah. And that's the that's the moment of truth. Yeah, you can be better, but you might make less money next month. Yeah, next year. Yeah, those are the moments of truth where you, you kind of need to confront it because that's where your offense defense thing comes in well yeah. defensively I want to make this much money either to invest or for the shareholders or yeah. you know how do you make those moments of truth trade offs yes and anyone can make it all work when when they don't have to make that trade off yeah I, 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 absolutely when there's the the short termism that kind of blinds the long term payoff and yeah you know that that sentiment the the long road to overnight success you know people yeah. forget the you know, the, the turbulence on the way to get there. Um, and I can only imagine, you know, for some... So Woolies, just to set the scene, employs how many people? Uh, directly, of just over about 201,000. Yeah. It's the biggest private employer in the country. In truth, if you look at contractors or people that we should see as well as team members, it's, it's closer to, you know, 300,000 probably. It's extraordinary. You know, that's a small city. <laughs> um, but the ability for that, um, your decisions and to translate knowing that at some point irrespective of what decision is going to be made by nature there are going to be unhappy people yeah. and then it's trusting in your vision your instinct and your gut but also the inputs and in your team to make the best decision over the long term which may mean short-term inconveniences is one of the entrepreneur's dilemmas where yeah. you're, you're worrying about the cash flow coming in you know yeah. as we know cash is king um but it's yeah, it's, it's one of the hardest things. And then I think from a business point of view, you know, in my journey is like, I just have to back myself in here because even if I stuff up, there is incremental lessons there that I need to take on board to the next time round. Um, and again, just I, I want to pick up that theme you yeah. said around crisis. So crisis leadership, I think, you know, everyone had their own internal journey of crisis leadership over the last couple of years, but particularly those like yourself leading significant scale businesses, you know, 200 to 300,000 staff. How did the last two and a half years test your crisis leadership? Uh, well, I mean, inside Woolworths, I thought it brought out the best of Woolworths. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's, and I said to our team, if we could just be as good, half as good outside of a crisis as we go into <laughs> yeah. crisis, you know, we're unstoppable. Yeah. Uh, but what it, you know, what it did, and I think this is the key lesson, you know, the, the, the risk in a crisis is you get tight uh, and you get a risk averse uh, and, and therefore you kind of hold back and you try and pull all the yeah. decisions to yourself. Um, what, you, what we found in a crisis, you need to empower the team. They know how to make good decisions, just empower them to do it. Mm. And it feels cri- kind of crazy, um, 
you, you feel like you need to kind of take on all the burden of the decisions. Actually, you've got to do the opposite. It's so counterintuitive. Empower the team, give the right framework and let them go. And you know what? Yeah. They'll make, you know, they'll make unbelievably great decisions mm. if you frame it up in context of purpose or in our case in, in, in the COVID crisis was we can do the right thing for Australia and New Zealand. So whatever the right thing is, if we need to find the competitive, we need to share our safety manuals with it, we're going yeah. to do it. And we're going to do it first so that we set the right tonality in the way relationships will work. Yeah. If the government wants us to do something, we're going to do it. Yeah. So we aren't going to compromise. Uh, we're going to do the right thing for Australia yeah. or New Zealand. And amazing things happen. I kept saying to our team, what's cool is when I wake, get to work on a Friday and find out all the things we did without someone asking me. Oh, uh, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think I think that's – people know what to do and people know what the right thing is. you just yeah. got to empower them. Yeah, and that's so contrary to, I think, the industrial revolutionary model of business, which was much more autocratic and do this, do that. And now, particularly with purpose-orientated yeah. businesses, is trust the genius of people, trust their decision-making abilities, their instincts, um, but also the ability, particularly for a crisis to, you know, they often say like a, it takes a tragedy to unite. Yeah. Um, and I think also the other side of that is crisis reveals character. And I think to your point, the fact that Woolies mobilised together um, during the last two and a half years and then outperformed or, you know, performed within the reasons of the constructs reflects, I think, the culture that is present, but all the way from, you know, from if you're packing shelves or if you're in, you know, the, the boardroom at the same time. Well, what I liked about the last two and a half years, which um, I read one of our competitors only really exhausted by, which many people are for mm. good reason, it was quite energising and quite inspiring actually. Uh, but what was another thing that was great is all these, you know, hardworking Australians that we take for granted were the heroes. Mm. I think mean, there's something really quite profound in that. Yeah. You know, as people are working packing shelves, they became heroes, right? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, working in healthcare, whatever the case may be. And I think it's reorientated us to, you know, you take these things for granted and there's hardworking people who do those things. So we should celebrate them. And when you celebrate them, you know what? They stand two inches taller and they do an even better job. Yeah, that's it. So, Brad, the other thing I wanted to talk yeah. to you about was mental health. You yeah. know, I know it's something you're personally very passionate by, um, but also I think in in a particular post-COVID world, if we can still say that, I think what COVID did was really shone the light in a few areas of, you know, how we all lived our lives. And one of the things that kind of, you know, arose was how we how do we treat ourselves and what are the systems around us that support mental well-being and human flourishing. I know both personally but also inside Woolies, mental health is something that, you know, you take really seriously. Um, yeah, how do you relate to mental health? It's obviously, you know, a topic of the zeitgeist at the moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, I relate to it firstly personally, of course, um, mm. and then um, and then in just looking at the stats inside Woolworths, right? So, um, you know, last month inside Woolworths, uh, 25 people had serious intent to take their own lives. Last month, five people attempted to do so. Um, fortunately, none of them were successful in doing so. Mm. That, um, on average, we lose a team member a month. So just you look at that stat, right? And that's the most extreme version of it. Um, at the more macro level, we had 750 people last month who phoned in with a mental health issue. So, like, it's present it's immediate and it's impacting many many people inside Woolworths and more broadly so I mean it's it's this one of the scourges of our generation I think it was a massive issue I should add before COVID mm. I think COVID just kind of put it on steroids because a lot of the normal social networking you know pro protocols broke down you know and now we come out the other side and then you've got uh, an overlay now of uh, financial insecurity mm. Uh, which doesn't help the situation at all. You know, it puts another huge pressure back in into the system. Um, so we're kind of dealing with a, a how do we socialise in a post-COVID world while many people who are not used to financial insecurity, the last time we had this level of financial insecurity was somewhere between 1999 and 2007. You know, yeah. a generation of consumers, business mm. leaders, is not used to confronting true financial insecurity. We talk about it at Woolies of um, there's a big difference between uh, inflation and, and cost of living pressure. Cost of living pressure is when you start making trade-offs 
between uh, you're going to pay the mortgage or, yeah. you know, how you're going to feed the family. Mm. So, yeah, it's a massive issue. Um, and I think it's only getting bigger, not not smaller, because of this confluence plus many things that you would know better than me, I'm, I'm sure, on social media and mm, absolutely. what it does uh, does to everyone. Yeah. And what what's Woolies doing about that now? But then also what do you think other corporates or, you know, Australian leaders yeah. can do with their businesses and their profiles? Uh, well, look, I mean, firstly, we should acknowledge it. I mean, you know, and it's acknowledging and it's been one that hasn't been well acknowledged in in the history in corporate Australia in increasing years. So I think us acknowledging and acknowledging we all have personal mental challenges and being open and avert to them. And I think we see a lot of great sports people be much more avert and I think it's a great, great thing. So got to make it comfortable that we can all yeah. talk about it. Uh, in our case, then, funny enough, we uh, we did a pretty cool thing, actually, um, uh, uh, with a business called Sonda, which you may or may not yeah, do. Do you know yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, what we found is our team needed someone safe that they could engage with. And if they felt they were engaging with Woolies, there was a risk of maybe it'll impact my career. Yeah. And, you know, I want to look invincible when I'm, you know, when I need help. And, mm. uh, and we did many things, but this is the one thing, Sonda, where – uh, it was a third-party service where any team member of Woolworths or their family on whatever the issue is can immediately reach out in a very safe way to Sonda who then engage with them on our behalf. Whether it's, I feel, um, I finished late at night working at the Metro in Surrey Hills and I'm nervous about walking back to the, the railway station. Someone will, they can send it and someone will come and walk with them to the railway station or I don't know how to balance the budget or... Uh, you know, I've got, you know, uh, suicidal tendencies, yeah. whatever the case may be. So we've got now about 35,000 people who, who actively use the app and awesome. use it and safely use it. So uh, that was a, a pretty cool thing that, and in fact, the Gonski family are investors, uh, I think, in that business as well. Uh, so acknowledge it, um, find safe ways that people can then find help. And the other thing we've done is, is lean into... Um, mental health training so we have an I Am Here program 20,000 people have done mental health training and I Am Here qualified or ambassadors for it and then in every store in the country we have at least one ideally two mental health uh, trained accredited professionals so kind of no one thing solves the problem yeah. you've got to have a whole range of things but there's a lot of good energy around each one of them, and each one of them is having traction. But someone, I uh, was at a, uh, we had a, um, a corporate mental health alliance. We hosted the, the folks out at our, uh, in Norwest last week, and there were all these corporates there, represented about half a million workers. Yeah. And someone said to him, You must feel proud about what you've done. And I said, How can you have pride in the space? That's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't think that word should be associated with this issue. You can have achievements and milestones, but um, that's not something to be proud about. It's something yeah. you should just do. Exactly. So I think it's you've got to be careful as well not to uh, ever think you've conquered this issue because it's not possible. Yeah, and human well-being should be a non-negotiable for all of us, particularly as leaders. You yeah, know, I think when people feel psychologically safe, empowered, they have agency, they have autonomy, and they have a vision that they're working towards, that's a recipe for success. And yeah. I'm excited now because I think about my generation coming through and, you know, purpose-driven businesses. I think we have this such an exciting time to like do well financially but do good socially at the same time mm -hmm. and the purpose being the kind of the guiding light as we evolve into this kind of new world that I think we can all feel the current structures are kind of getting stretched a bit and then this, as all things, as is the cycle of life, there is going to be a rebirth and I think these purpose-orientated businesses, it's incredibly exciting. But the other thing, is you can't bullshit purpose like people feel whether it's authentic or not and I think this next generation coming through from what I sense from you know the tens of thousands of young men that Man Cave work with to the thousands of male customers or the female buyers of male products the the authenticity the beautiful thing about authenticity is you can't replicate it it's it's so unique it's so poignant to the moment or to whatever that thing is and I think that's, you know, that's one of the big things I'm really taking away from today is like I can feel, 
you like I can feel you and I can feel the authenticity around you living the purpose as a walking embodiment of Woolies. But also then that ripples all through, you know, the consciousness of the business, the staff, the structures, all the kind of the frameworks, but then the initiatives so that people feel like they want to come to work, they feel held, particularly as my sense is we're going to go through a few bumpier times to come before we kind of get a bit more stability. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, by the way, in, in this whole process, um, implicit is I'm, 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 I'm not perfect. I've made many mistakes even today about being better together, mm. uh, and they're on my mind as we sit down and talk. So we're all on the same journey together. Mm. Which, but it's nice to have that common bounds on which the journey you're under. I think we're at a very interesting moment of purpose, and you're an entrepreneur, and um, it's on my mind a lot. Just you are starting to see these huge layoffs come through. Yeah. And obviously, in some cases, they are required in order to, you know, make the organisation successful in the long term. Yeah. But how do you navigate them, lean into them authentically, uh, is is a big issue. So I think we're about to be tested in ways, yeah, very different ways to COVID mm-hmm. in the next six months. And I'm sure you'll you yeah. know, be tested in your way, and I'll be tested in mine. And so. We'll swap notes and see see how, <laughs> see how we went. Well, maybe we'll check back in in six months and have another conversation. Yeah, well, it's, it's yeah. a very, um, I think there's a moment right now yeah. where um, we're going to be tested on purpose. Yeah, I agree. And what's particularly tricky, I, th- I think, is there's still a baseline fatigue of many people, you know, who haven't had a circuit break or a decompressed or processed the last two and a half years because they've been in a level of survival mode. And then we get tested again, but in an entirely different way. But also, like, change is inevitable and it's how do we adapt and move, right? And But I think we're just getting this meta lesson right now from, you know, whether you believe there are higher powers, <laughs> you know, but some meta lesson in to take care of ourselves and a return back into community because um, I think we've gone very hard the other way yeah. over recent times. And, you know, even, you know, the language I've heard you talk today around Woolies being an ecosystem, you know, that's a very different way to talk about business to then... 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it's even if we use that as like a signal, what language are we mm. using to describe the cultures and the business structures we want? I think that's very fascinating for me. So I do think there is this return back to nature, to, you know, in, we're very fortunate in Australia to have mm. First Nations, um, mm. incredible First Nations knowledge around us. I think there's going to be more integration of that. You know, some of the most incredible, sustainable minds and souls our first nations um, brothers and sisters but also their pattern recognition their designing of systems is extraordinary so i think in particular from you know the, the people that i know who are in that space it's like yeah there's this opening happening and corporate australia is listening they want to keep elevating the voices you know more than just the voice to parliament but just inside of businesses too so i think we're up for a really exciting next few years but i also think it's going to be tough and it's going to shape us in ways we don't know yet uh, I don't think I could I could better that. So yeah, that's a great place to finish. <laughs> okay, well, Brad, I want to say thank you so much. You know, I'm really genuinely very, very appreciative. I mentioned that, um, you know, uh, Stu Gregor, Shane, um, Shane Young, we had, you know, the Gonski family, you know, have all spoke very highly of you. And, um, yeah, like I'm, I'm a young entrepreneur who's passionate about changing the world. So it means a lot that you just carve out the time. And the other side of it is, you know, Woolies, employs you know so many young people and these are young people that we work with daily so it is a it's a rite of passage to to pack shelves and you know to or to whatever the evolution of that is so yeah thank you for just playing such a like a stable role for so many young people well 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 done for you with uh, all your initiatives around the cave which i think is a a super cool uh, analogy for young young males we got Mm. thirty five thousand team members are under 25 years of age working at uh, Woolies. So mm. it's an incredibly important part and our aspiration is to be the seminal experience for a first job for, for, for young Australians. And we're not there yet, but I'd, I'd love us to be and, uh, you know, that work ethic and purpose that they can imbue the broader society with. Yeah, awesome. And from yeah, from a staff perspective, like Man Cave's working inside the school system and staff's really looking to kind of be this modern men's brand that's like unshackles all this old outdated, you know, masculine norms into just being free and expressive and authentic and I think using the power of product and brand and storytelling to really create a positive future state for masculinity because there aren't many right now. You know, I would say we're at an inflection point for for masculinity and our hope and what we're starting to get a bit more traction in now is stuff playing this role, just kind of elevate positive male, you know, 
diverse voices that are inspiring for, for young men. So, yeah, thank you for all that no, you, well you, you do. You. And, um, yeah, we, we've enjoyed our, our time at Woolies as well. Shout out Hayden, our category manager, who started, he's been in the business 18 years, started packing shelves, and now he's our category manager. So I think that's a, a great success story and a reflection of the culture. So thanks again, Brad. No, thank you, Arthur. Awesome.